Pastor Mike here. Hey, just want to say thanks for uh, watching our YouTube channel. And uh, may God bless you with the hearing of His Word. Morning. And as they say down south, amen. If that don't light your fire, your wood's wet, amen. That's just how it goes. All right. Well, wow, good to have us together. Good to be together. Good to be able to open God's Word together. Good to sing together. Good to pray together, amen. What a what a needful thing in the the dark world that we live in, brothers. As we see it continue, as uh, Spurgeon spoke often of the downgrade. And as you often, brothers, as you know, we are in America in one of the steepest downgrades that our nation has ever seen. People have put away their Bibles, amen. I mean, it's an amazing thing. The Bible is more accessible. Here's the funny thing about this whole thing. I mean, we got people who come, amen. I, I'm old-fashioned, all right? I come from the old Bob Jones place, you know what I mean? Where you have your Bible in your hand, amen. But these young people, some of these young people, they got those phones, amen. And they just, they carry that thing around and... It's got the Bible on there. I mean, we've never, listen, had such access to the God's Word. And uh, it's amazing. And yet, brethren, listen, listen. Never has there been more ignorance concerning it. Never have men in America been so blind to the actual truths of Scripture. I mean, it's amazing what Satan has done. Amen? He's elevated. Listen, it's amazing to see this. And I was telling my wife last night that it's amazing, as we are opening our Bibles to Mark chapter 3 this morning, Mark chapter 3, and uh, I told her, I, you know, you, 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 you go through Bible college and you live your life, amen, you live your life, amen, you study the scriptures, and boy, it's amazing how God has really just opened my eyes to the absolute and utter hatred that they really had for our Lord and Savior, amen. I mean, it's amazing, you, you read it. You study it, you get down a little deeper into it, and it's just an amazing thing. And yet, through all of it, Sovereign God is working out His perfect plan. I mean, it's just an amazing thing to behold. And uh, so this morning, uh, as we uh, open our Bibles together to Mark chapter 3, um, last week I entitled my sermon, The Unpardonable Sin, and uh, I should have entitled it, uh, the road leading up to the unpardonable sin, because we never got there. <laughs> and uh, so this morning, I'd like to entitle this one, The Impardonable Sin, Part 2. Amen? Because there's what happened as we've been going down systematically, verse by verse through Scripture, we, see, we, we continue to see the opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ, as God Himself in the flesh, as He walked here amongst men. It's an amazing thing. So let's read that together, verses 24 through 30 this morning, Mark chapter 3. Taking up there at verse number 24, the Bible says, God says, And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into the, a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first... Bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, that is such, and when we get to this verse, that is such a foundational and bedrock thing that Jesus says here. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemes wherewith uh, soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath neither forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Verse 30, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Let's pray together this morning. Father, again, we are certainly amazed at the word of God this morning. We're certainly astonished, as we looked at earlier in the chapter. They were astonished out of measure about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as you came in the flesh... As you dwelt among us, you walked, and Father, there was much opposition to your preaching. Just like there is today to the preaching of the gospel. Men will not hear it unless the Spirit of God, of course, is drawing them, unless the Spirit of God, of course, is opening their eyes, and of course, unless the Spirit of God is opening their ears and their heart to understand, there is no 
hearing or seeing or understanding. So, Father, this morning we pray. It's our prayer, isn't it, as Paul prayed for those whom he loved. He said in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. And Father, we too have friends and relatives and neighbors and work acquaintances who are lost and don't even know it. And Father, we pray for them this morning as a, as a church. Those blood-bought saints this morning, we are in agreement, Father, that we would pray for them. Father, uh, we pray also for... The Christian this morning, as well as the Word of God is going to be taught. It's the same thing, Father. Uh, the Spirit must be working in our own hearts and our own lives. Father, that you might... Maybe there's someone here this morning who needs the Spirit to uh, lift them up a little bit. Maybe there's some this morning here, the Spirit needs to convict them of their sin. They've been in a continual, perpetual sin that they're trying to overcome. They're fighting it, and yet it hasn't been granted by you, Father... May you help us with that this morning. Father, we're all sinners, all of us, every last one of us. The Bible says, doesn't it, in Romans chapter 3, six things that all men are guilty of. All have fallen short. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. They all together have gone aside. And Father, this morning, we're thankful for your mercy, for your grace as we looked at in Sunday school this morning. For your grace, your mercy, and the Holy Spirit who regenerates, who calls, and who seals for the day of redemption. Father, again now I ask that you be glorified in the word as it's read, the word as it's preached. Father, we ask and pray these things now again in the name that is above every name, the name that the Bible says that uh, the, the demons shudder at, the name at which every tongue will confess and every knee will bow, bend, <laughs> the name of Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, uh, last Lord's Day morning, this is the wonderful thing about expository preaching. You just simply take it right up, amen, where you left off last week. There's never a break in it, and that's what's wonderful about it. So, by way of remembrance, because maybe you don't have a mind like mine, but I'm fairly forgetful, amen, and it seems to be getting worse as I get a little bit older. Last Lord's Day morning, we examined together how that the Lord Jesus Christ's friends thought that he had lost his wits. You remember that, right? Not only that he had lost his wits, but that he was mad. In fact, they accused him of being insane. I mean, it's an amazing thing. We talked about that. We also observed, amen, by the inspired pen of Mark, that his enemies, the scribes, listen, charged him with a most vile and blasphemous accusation. Amen? We remember that. And they said that the Lord Jesus Christ was not only aligned with Beelzebub, the prince of devils, but that he was in fact possessed by the Lord of filth, the Lord of flies, and of course we looked at those names, the Lord of dung. We saw that there. This is what his enemies are accusing him of. His friends think he's mad, amen? His enemies are accusing him of being possessed by the prince of devils. We step back and you just got to stand back and go, wow, that's an amazing thing that they would accuse him of, for sure. So in response to their devilish and vile accusations, amen, uh, the Lord Jesus in verse 23, you remember, calls them unto himself and begins a sequence of parables this morning that we're going to look at with the question, how can Satan cast out Satan? And we remember, don't we, we looked at the number of times that the Lord Jesus Christ answered a question with a question. <laughs> You remember that. In fact, if you look in Scripture, he's asked 183 times a question. He only answers three of them in the first person. Otherwise, he allows them, and we looked at the leading questions. We looked at the type of questions that he was um, asking. Now, brethren, we remember that a parable, okay, this is what we're going to see this morning. A parable is a short story used by the Lord Jesus to teach a moral or spiritual lesson. Amen? And we see here in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, and Mark, and in Luke, it's amazing when you think about this for a moment. Think about the, 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 the number of parables that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. Are you aware that one-third of what he taught, he taught in parables? Think about that for just a moment. One-third of everything when he was walking here on the earth, God in the flesh, 
God who was sinless, God who was perfect, God who went to the cross, God who shed his blood, God who went to the grave, and amen, and rose again for his sheep, one-third of his teaching contains and was taught in parables. That is an amazing thing when you think about that. Just to name a few. You remember them, don't we? The new cloth on the old, amen? You can't have that. It doesn't work, amen? The sower of the seed, which we're going to get to. The wise and foolish builders, the ten virgins, the lost sheep, the lost coins. I mean, it goes on and on. The prodigal son, the persistent widow. So we see in Scripture just all of these parables in which he spoke. And this morning, as we again turn to Matthew or Mark chapter 3, we're going to see here a series of four parables that the Lord Jesus Christ teaches. Amen? It's an amazing thing that he would have to go to this level to get these men to, even, even at that time, they didn't understand it. But look at verses 24 through 26 again. Let's just read those, and then we're just going to kind of break them down verse by verse. The Bible says there in verse 24, And if a what? Amen. Kingdom. Amen be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Look at verse 25. And if a what? House. I mean, Jesus again is using illustrations for us, brethren, that are not going to be hard for them to understand. It should not be hard for us to understand. Amen? And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Look at verse 26. And if what? Satan rise up against Satan, amen, against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but half and end. Now there in verse 24, we're just going to break these things down just a little bit. He uses a secular illustration here. So what he's doing is he's looking at these men who are trying to entrap him, amen, once again. And he just asks a simple question in verse 23. If Satan is divided, how can he stand? He says, all right, let me ask you a question that you may understand. Listen, if a kingdom is divided against itself, listen, if a kingdom is at war, if there's much turmoil and much disagreement within a kingdom, he says... Amen? There's no way that thing can stand. It will not stand. And it's like, you, you, okay, you think to yourself, okay, I get that. Amen? I understand that. The second thing he uses there is a home, a house. Now listen, brethren, those of us who are married, those of us who have had children, even some of us who aren't married yet, we can certainly understand this. Listen, brother, if a husband and wife are constantly battling, and constantly at, at, at odds with one another. If, they, if their children are constantly battling, and constantly at odd with, odds with one another, that house cannot stand. There has to be unity in order for that thing to stand. And so this is what Jesus is doing. He's really giving us a clear uh, uh, picture, if you will, of what it means to be disunified and what it means to be unified. Listen, when there's disunity, it's not going to stand. So how in the world can you stand there and accuse me of this vile and wicked accusation that I'm driving out and doing what I'm doing under the spirit of the prince of demons. I mean, it's crazy to think and try and understand that. So he uses a secular illustration, he uses a social illustration, and finally in verse 26 there, he uses a spiritual illustration. And he basically he says this, you blind guides, you stiff-necked people. I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it? Not our natures and what we do. Don't realize or understand, listen, brother, that I'm actually, that I'm actually, amen, doing the opposite of what you are accusing me of. This vile and odious accusation. Let me, let's look at this together for a moment. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. I want you to see this. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Again, we, you know, we bounce around here and there. You want to allow the scriptures to speak. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse Number 27. We'll start there. Again, a, a little more detailed, uh, uh, I guess if you will, account of when they're standing there together. You remember, you remember Mark. He is very fast. Again, he is moving right along. And immediately, and immediately, and immediately, you look in Scripture. We looked at that, how he's just moving along, telling everyone who this great servant, the God, the, the perfect servant of God is. So we see here that Mark gives us a little more detail. Now look what he says here. And if by Beelzebub, uh, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do what? Your children. You see that there? That's very important. Amen? Because again, he, Mark, or Matthew's given us a little more detail concerning this. By whom do your children cast them out? The question becomes, who's their children? Who's, who are the children that, that Jesus is talking about here? As he's bringing this to their attention. 
Therefore, they shall be your what? Judges. Now look at what he says here. Verse number 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, listen, then the kingdom of God is what? The kingdom of God has come upon you. Brethren, this is one of the things that was prophesied about in old, and spoken of, amen? In the old, these are things he's doing to show his Messiahship. That he's God in the flesh. He's here healing and he's raising the dead and he's opening the eyes of the blind. He's, he's doing all of these things. And here they stand, blind and deaf and mute, dumb as dogs. It's an amazing thing. He says, look, if I'm doing this by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is what? It's come upon you. Now, the question is I want to answer quickly that because when you go to scriptures and he asks a question, you always want to answer it. Amen? Who are the children that he's talking about? I'm glad you asked. Look at Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9. Who are the children that, is, that are also doing this? And again, they're going to be your judge. Amen? You're accusing me of, of, uh, of doing this by the prince of demons, the prince of devils. And then... Look at Mark chapter 9. Look at verse number 38. Look at verse number 38. And John answering him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out what? Devils in thy name. And he followeth not us. And we forbid him, because he followeth not us. Look at verse 39. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is what? Not against us is what? On our part. Again, the, we see that unity there that he's talking about when he uses those first three parables. He's saying, look, if you're disunified, Satan can't drive out semen. Demons aren't going to drive out demons. And neither, as the things that I'm doing here, are of that. They are of God himself. And if they are, you know, if they are, the kingdom of God has come upon you. It really is just a stunning and amazing thief to see the depths. Listen, all of Galilee... All of the theological leaders, all of the theological men that were there, all the theologians from Jerusalem can see the dismissive way in which the Lord Jesus Christ, my tie pin fell off, I lost, oh here it is, it's flailing, I'm flailing and melting and whatever else I do, amen, hey, but they clearly saw the dismissive way in which the Lord Jesus just said, away with you, amen, the demons would come up and he'd just simply tell them, hey, off you go, off with you, amen. He sends every kind of evil spirit, even the most horrific and, mar and malicious ones, back to the pit. Brethren, the kingdom of God was truly upon these men. It's an amazing thing. It's Jesus is working through that. Now, he begins here, looking back at Mark chapter 3. So the first three parables, he uses again a kingdom. He uses a house. Hey, look, we understand if a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And if Satan is divided against himself, he's not going to stand. It's very, very simple. Amen. Now look at the fourth one here. Look at verse number 27. He again uh, uses this parable. The Bible says, that the, what's that first, those first two words? No man. There's really four things here that you need to underline in your Bible if you haven't. No man can enter into a strong man's house, listen, and what? And spoil his goods, except he first, what? Bind the strong man. Amen? There's a lot here. And then he will spoil his house. What is Jesus saying there? Well, again, as he speaks in parables, the, verse, the first part of the verse there, no man, no man there, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a picture of him. He is the no man. Amen? No man, he says, can come in and enter into what? A strong man's house. Who's the strong man that's being spoken of here? Who, who is Jesus referencing here? Well, the devil. Satan himself. No man can come into the strong man's house, listen, and what? And spoil his goods. What are the goods? You got the Lord Jesus speaking of himself. You got the strong man devil per current there. And then to spoil his goods. Who, what are the goods? Well, the goods are the sheep who belong to Christ. That's what he's talking about here. Jesus has to come, amen, and enter into the strong man's house. And then when he's in there, he's going to first bind the strong man. Well, how did he bind the strong man? <laughs> you know, this is pretty, I mean, we've got the scriptures, amen. He bound the strong man through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how he bound him. This is it. This is what we see clearly in scripture. The Lord Jesus comes to Satan. He, he spoils his goods by the gospel. 
by that which he is going to take, the spoils of his. Look here, if you would, at Luke chapter 15. Let me just show you this real quickly here this morning. Look at Luke chapter 15. And again, we, uh, we're going to look at a couple of parables. And I want you to see here these particular three parables, amen, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son all have three things in common. And uh, I'm only going to look at two of them, but I've preached on this before. They all have, uh, they're all linked together by three things. And I want you to see this together this morning. Look at Luke chapter 15. Look at verse number 3. Look at verse number 3. Look what the Bible says there. And he spake this what? Parable unto them, saying, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave his nine, the ninety and nine into the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, what? Rejoicing. The three things we're going to see with these parables, they have three things. There's rejoicing. There's something that was found that was lost, amen, and there's a great celebration. I mean, it's an amazing thing. You see these three parables all linked together with those three things. Now look what it says here. The Bible says, and when he cometh home, he shall get, uh, call together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, what's that next word? Rejoice with me, amen, for I have found my sheep. So that thing, he wants to rejoice because something's been found. Look what it says there. Uh, and my sheep, which was what? Lost. Rejoice, because I found that which was lost. Now look at the reaction. This is the whole idea here. This is the whole thing you want to see here. Look at verse number, uh, uh, look at verse number 7. I say unto you that likewise, what's that word? Joy shall be where? In heaven. Over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Look at verse 8. He continues right on there. Again, you're going to see these things are all tied together here, these parables. Either that woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose it, uh, one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she hath found it, she calls her who? Her friends and her neighbors together saying, what? Rejoice. You see that there's some rejoicing going on. Again, that connection that's made there. For I have what? Found so, we're rejoicing because we found something, amen, which I have lost. We're rejoicing because the lost have been found. Now, you remember, it's the same thing. We don't have the time to go to the prodigal son. That connection is made with him as well. What I want you to see, though, again, is in verse 10. We're talking about spoiling the devil's goods. We're talking about spoiling his house. Look what the Bible says there. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels in the angels of God over one sinner that what? Repentant. This is the idea. This is what we're talking about here. This is God himself, amen, coming. Listen, it's amazing. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the kingdom of darkness. Listen, get a hold of this. This, again, just stunning. He has triumphed over the God of this world and has carried off his possessions. It's an amazing. Every time the Lord Jesus Christ delivers a man or a woman... Out of their sin, he has carried off that possession of Satan. It's an amazing thing to see and behold. The gospel of Christ, listen, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Amen? And what does Paul say? According to the what? According to the scriptures. Amen? The gospel is that with, with that great chain in which the Lord Jesus has wrapped around Satan and has spoiled all of his goods. Amen? If you're saved this morning, brethren, if you're washed in the blood, amen, God intervened, and he saved you, and he took you out of the spoils, out of the darkness, amen, out of hell itself, and took for himself you as a child, amen, you as a sheep. That's what Jesus is saying here. This is what he's trying to teach us. Now, he lays those four parables out there, and then he, then, and turn with me back to Mark chapter 3, because this is very important, brother. So very important. It's foundational. It goes to the very truth of Scripture. It goes to the very thing that we're standing up here reading this morning. And this is a great question for all of us, isn't it? Look at Mark chapter 3. Look at the first part of verse number 28 there. Mark chapter 3. Look at the verse, just the very first part of it. In verse 28, it says, Verily I say unto you. Mark under the inspiration of God, 
brethren, introduces to us for the first time, amen, a statement, a phrase that is made by the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. This is what he says. And it's fundamental and it's foundational. It is a bedrock statement, amen, that Jesus makes here. We find this particular statement by Christ 77 times in Holy Writ. When Jesus says, verily I say unto you, he is saying, I tell you the truth. Amen. This is foundational, brethren. This is so important. So when Jesus speaks, is he telling us the truth? That's the question, isn't it? This is the biggest issue confronting all lost sinners. This is the biggest issue confronting you and I as Christians as well this morning. Whether or not we are going to cleave to the word of God. Is what Jesus is saying the truth? The issue this morning, brethren, is not whether we have a happier life. Whether this is our best life now. Because as MacArthur says, right, amen, if this is your best life now, you're straight on the road to hell. This is not the question this morning, brethren, whether our life is going to be happy, whether we're going to be better or not. Because, listen, if we just simply follow the teachings of Christ, our lives will be better. Amen? It will be. That's not the question. The issue is not, can we have better marriages? Listen, this morning, if you want a better marriage, all you have to do, amen, is implement the Christian teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ taught and that God taught into your marriage. And guess what? There's no question you will have a better marriage marriage. That's not the issue. That's not the question this morning. All of these are true. All of it's true. But the issue we have confronting us this morning is this issue. Does Jesus tell the truth? This is what we must conform ourselves to. Amen? Now listen, 14 times in this gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to pause. Listen, it should cause us all to pause. Though everything he says is true. Amen? Amen? I mean, if you don't believe that, you're in trouble. Amen? Shut your Bible, you might as well go home. That's what I, you know, we were talking last night at men's prayer. There's churches in this town when you go ask the pastor, do you believe the whole word of God is true? No. Well, then you shut the Bible and go home, you devil. It's that simple. I always say I couldn't preach up here. If I didn't think this was God's authoritative word, I couldn't stand in front of you this morning and preach to you. I would go to the golf course because my golf game stinks and I need some help with my golf game. Listen, is what Jesus is saying true? That's the question, brethren, this morning. Listen, it is an amazing thing. Listen again. He's going to pause. He's going to summon you and I. Listen, please, take this very carefully. He's going to summon you and I to heed what he says with these words. Verily. I say unto you. In other words, that which I'm going to speak is true. Absolutely. Positively. I want you to see this. Look at Mark chapter 6. Just flip over there just a couple of times where he says this. And I want us to take special note. That word verily means truly. Truly, truly. Truly I say to you. Amen. Look at Mark chapter 6. Again, 14 times. We're not going to look at all of them. We're just going to look at a couple of them. Because eventually... You know, four years from now, when we get to Mark chapter 6, amen, we'll get there, amen, we'll find it. Look at Mark chapter 6, look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust from under your feet, for a testimony against them. What's that next word? Verily. Verily. In other words, truly, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for who? Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Think of that. Yes, that's true. It's absolutely true. Jesus just told us that when they rejected the preaching of the apostles and they were to shake the dust off their feet, he said, Verily I say to you, truly I tell you, it's going to be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those who reject the message of Christ. Verily I say unto you. Look at another one. Look at Mark chapter 14. Again, just a couple of them here this morning as we... Uh, go down through Holy Writ together. Look at Mark chapter 14. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said what? Verily, I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall what? Betray me. Did one of them that was eating with him betray him? Of course he did, right? 
We looked at Judas just a couple weeks ago. We looked at that devil who was inside doing the things that the other apostles, he looked like one of them, he acted like one of them. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, there's somebody here. That's Let me show you one more thing. This is what I like. about. Look at John. There's, there's one in John over here I want us to look at quickly. Again, you can, you can go through the scriptures. We talked about technology this morning. I have this app on my phone. It's called the And Bible. You ever heard of that? The And Bible. It's wonderful. You know, it makes you lazy, too. Because uh, what, what you do is you pull it open, and all I have to do is type in these a word, a couple of words, a phrase, and it'll tell me everywhere it's found in Scripture. It'll also tell me what the Greek meaning is. It tells me what the Hebrew meaning is. Amen. It's a wonderful thing, and you should try it. So all you got to do is type in, Verily I say unto you, and you'll see everywhere in Scripture where he says this. But look here at John chapter 3, and it's amazing because, see, don't us Protestants, don't us Protestants get accused of making things up? <laughs> Sometimes we get, a, we get accused of that stuff. And I want you to see here, Jesus, of course, is having his wonderful conversation with our good friend Nicodemus. In verse 3, he says this, Jesus answered and said unto him, What? Verily, not once, twice. Verily, verily, I say unto you. In other words, truly, truly, I say unto you, he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Listen, the Protestants didn't make that up. Jesus made it up. Jesus is the one who said that truly you must be born again. This is what he's saying. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, you must be born again. Look down there at verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I'm telling you, if you're not born again, listen, you're not going into the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. Not me. Not the Protestant preachers. And the word term born again is scriptural. That's something that Jesus himself taught. And he says, by the way, I'm telling you the truth concerning this. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing to see the number of times that he used that portion of scripture, that particular phrase or statement. Brethren, all of scripture, listen, if you're saved this morning, all of scripture, all of salvation, all of what we're standing up here preaching and teaching this morning is dependent upon him telling the truth. Do you understand this? That's how important this is. And he lays it out, and it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. Because listen, the next portion of Scripture we get to here is so needful, and it's so important to understand this. When he says something to you, it is guaranteed. It is true. Look back there at Mark chapter 3. Why did he lay that out there? Why is he saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, or verily, I say unto you, this is truth. Now look at verse 28. Verily I say unto you, what are the next two words? All, sin. All sins. Brethren, listen, this is so vital, again, to the Christian faith, to what we believe. He says, verily, ver verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith uh, soever they shall blaspheme. Again, brethren. It's amazing. This is imperative that we understand that Jesus is speaking the truth to us. Can you imagine not knowing if you're saved or not? Can you imagine if you go to the scriptures, the foundation of the word, and you question it over and over? Now listen, I'm not saying you don't question it. Listen, if you have a lifestyle of sin, you need to question whether or not you made a true profession of faith. Otherwise, you lied to yourself. God didn't call you. Now listen, it's so important, isn't it? It's so important to consider these things. Listen. This wonderful statement that he made. All sins of men shall be forgiven them. What a wonderful truth that should ring in our ears and in the ears of the sinner. Listen. Is it true? May it be true, this wonderful statement, says the pedophile. May it be true, says the murderer. May it be true, says the blasphemer. 
May these words, the Son of God, that all of your sins will be forgiven you. Is it true, said the fornicator? Is it true, said the sodomite? Is it true, said the lesbian? Is it true, said the transgender? Is what Jesus Christ said true? I'm glad you asked. Amen? I want to tell you this morning that they are. I want to show you this. We looked a little bit at it this morning in Sunday school. Amen? Look at Romans chapter 5. Is it true, brother? Is it true? Yes. It's absolutely true. And I want you to see, again, this description. And there's two words that if you don't have an underline in your Bible, I'd like you to underline them as we look at them. Amen? Look at verse 6. Howard read it this morning. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. Anybody ungodly this morning? I guarantee you I was ungodly. I was an ungodly, wicked, adulterous, sinner, drunkard. The ungodly, that's who he died for. The ungodly. Look at the next thing. Look at verse number 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. And the favorite and my favorite conjunction in all of Scripture, you should underline this. Look at what it says. But God. Hey, we are enemies of the cross. We are enemies of Christ. And the Bible says, but God. But God what? Commendeth. He gives his love towards us. We're enemies, brethren. Listen, and he commends his love towards us. Listen, uh, towards us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. So we're described as ungodly. Now we're described as sinners. And the Bible says that God commendeth his love towards us. Now look at the words I want you to underline. The first two words of verse 9. Much more. Do you see that there? Much more. In other words, that those words literally mean superfluity. It means it's overabundance. You're an enemy of God. You're a sinner. You're this, you're that. And the Bible tells us, hey, much more. Look at here. Then being just now being justified by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath through him. Look at verse 10. For if, yet, what, uh, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Underline this. Much more. There it is again. Hey, this superfluity, this abundance of Christ, his finished work being bestowed upon the sinner. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Look at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. By whom we have now received the what? The atonement. See what you got to do here, brother. And I'm going to give you a little English lesson this morning with that word. That is a, what do they call that? A three-syllable word. And if you put the syllables in there, the dash is in there where it goes. Atonement, listen, says at one meant. It means that you are apart from God, you are an enemy of God, and you know what God did? Through His atonement, He brought you in with Him. That means at one meant. That means that He brings you in, brother, much more than any sin that you could ever commit. The Lord Jesus' finished work is so much greater. Look here, if you would, at verse number 15. He's not, Paul's not done yet. Again, Howard, you read this this morning. I wanted to jump up and down, but I didn't dare. <laughs> if I fall down, I'm getting old. I may not get up. Look at verse 15. But not so is the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of many be dead, what are those next two words? Much more. Superfluity and abundance. It's an overabundance. Christ finished work. It's an amazing thing. The grace of God, the gift of by grace, which is by one man, Christ Jesus, hath abounded unto many. Look at verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift, listen, you ever hand out tracts? You've ever gone out handing tracts before? Right? Hey, it's a free gift. It's a free gift. This is what the Bible calls it. It's free. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't do it. It's a free gift. Here you go. This is what Paul says. It's a free gift. Look what he says. Is of many offenses unto justification. Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one. What says next two words? Much more. Much more. Oh, brothers, listen. 
This is a wonderful portion of Scripture. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Brethren, I ask this morning, when Jesus speaks, is He speaking truth? Is He telling you all your sins? Brethren, will be removed from you by the overabundance, by the much more of my grace. Yes, yes. See, I mentioned the sodomites, and I mentioned the fornicator, and I mentioned the adulterer. I, me I mentioned all those things, because that's what sinning people do. Amen? Now listen, let me just show you here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, you remember that word, but? Uh, I like that word. I like that word a lot. But God. You find that in Titus chapter 3 too, right, right, Howard? But God, <laughs> you know, the kindness of God, I mean, it's an amazing thing. Look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me show you this here. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look here what it says. Look at verse number 9, a very familiar portion of Scripture. But ye uh, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Question mark. Be not deceived. Neither what? Fornicators. Hey, let's just go down the list here. I mean, you know what I mean? Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, or, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the infeminine. Now, if I didn't have young ears in here, I would describe to you what that is. Okay, there's two here. There's two kinds. Amen? The infeminate, if you understand this, is the soft one. He's the one being sodomized. The infeminine, this is what we see. We see it all over today, don't we? We see it in our streets. There's not men anymore, amen? It, they look like a bunch of girls running around, acting like them, infeminine. There's something just evil and wicked about that. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. They are the ones doing the wicked deed. One soft and feminine, one is the other, whatever you want to call it. Now look at verse 10. Nor thieves nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 11. And what? Such were some of you. What's that next word? But. Man, I'll tell you. This is so exciting. You know, if I wasn't so old, I'd do a cartwheel off the front of the pulpit here and land on my feet. It's so amazing. Look at here. But ye are what? Washed. Ye are sanctified. Amen. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Wow. That's an amazing thing when you try and get a hold of that. But God. So listen, I ask you this morning, in all seriousness, brother, have you gone like David, the killer and the adulterer, and asked God for mercy? Hmm? Have you done that this morning? Has God opened your heart to do that? Have you gone like Paul, the chief of sinners, and asked for pardon? Have you? Listen, it's an amazing thing when God opens your eyes to realize that you are a sinner. You are what we named here in 1 Corinthians. All of us were. The question is, are you like them? Have you asked for pardon this morning? I like what one preacher said. Listen. There is grace abounding to the chief of sinners. Listen. It's depths the angels cannot sound. Oh, it's amazing. It's so deep. It's so wonderful. It's so amazing. We sing that song, Amazing Grace. Listen. The angels can't even comprehend the depth of this grace that he's bestowed upon us as sinners. Amazing. Listen. Mercy for you and for me. And your sins, however terrible they are, is found, I love this, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verily I say unto you, truly I say unto you, that all of your sins will be forgiven when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is speaking truth, brethren, to all of us. Everything he says is truth. Everything. You know what we got to do? We got to get ourselves, amen, lined up with Scripture. Hey, it's like that illustration I always use, right, Howard? My stepdad was a pilot, and it's an amazing thing. It really, it still stuns me today. 
He was learning how to fly with instruments. Remember that, Howard? And he's got this, he's in a, in a simulator, and he's got this instrument he's looking at right here. And he said, that, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how they do it. I, I don't know. But you can literally fly in an airplane into a bank, uh, a bank of clouds. And if you're not paying attention, you can actually end up upside down and not know you're upside down. How does this happen? How do I not know my blood pressure is you know, doing this? But he said it was an amazing thing because the hardest thing for him to do was to, you know, he felt like he was right side up, but he looked at this gauge and went, I'm upside down. I've got to follow the gauge. This is what Scripture does. Amen. Scripture teach, keeps us on the straight and narrow. Amen. Scripture teaches us what God says. Huh. I, li I like to, you know, just get after it once in a while. Amen? Amen. It is what keeps us, brethren, on the rails. It absolutely is. God himself, Jesus himself said, Verily I say unto you, it is true. It's absolutely true. All right, now, let's, uh, let's finish this up. Look back at Mark chapter 3. Look back at Mark chapter 3. Look at verses 29 and 30. Mark chapter 3, verses 29 and 30. We'll read that together. <clears throat> my pages are stuck together. Kind of like my armpits, huh? All right. <laughs> Look at verse 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said, you want to know what the impardonable sin is? You ever had it? What's the impardonable sin? Well, Holy Writ just told us what it is. There, there, there's not a question about what it is. Have you ever committed them? Have you ever had some, hey, have you committed the impardonable sin? No. Because they said he had an unclean spirit. Now Jesus, did he not just tell us in the previous verse that all of our sins can be forgiven? He now tells the scribes, listen, that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiven. The word blaspheme means to speak evil of. It means to rail at. It means to, to revile with disdain. And so we have here these men. Look at attributing the work of God, the Holy Spirit of God, who is the third person of the Trinity. I had Seth ask me this morning, what does the Holy Spirit look like? I don't know, he's a spirit. I, I've not seen him, but I told him he lives here in our hearts. Amen. When he saves you, he comes in, he regenerates, he comes in. I can't see him, but he's here. Amen. You cannot be forgiven of the impardonable sin. Let me show you this. This is interesting, and then we'll... We'll finish that. Look at Mark chapter 15. I want you to, again, keeping in mind the definition of blasphemy. Again, let me, let me uh, help you. It means to speak evil of, to rail at, to revile with disdain. Look at Mark chapter 15. Look at here. And eventually, right in about nine years, like it was four years to get to chapter 7. Nine years we'll get here. But it's a wonderful... Wonderful thing. Look at Mark chapter 15. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, God says, And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. A very familiar portion of Scripture to all of us. Amen. I mean, think of what's happening here. God's holy Scripture is being fulfilled. Amen. Because the next verse tells us that. Doesn't it? Look what it says. And the scripture was fulfilled. Hey, Andy Stanley, you devil. Huh? Don't unhook yourself from the Old Testament, you devil. Hey, you hang on to that thing and you rightly divide it. Again, over and over again, the Holy Writ, amen. The, the Old Testament, listen, the New Testament is the inspired commentary on the Old. You don't unhook from it. You rightly divide the ceremonial law, which Jesus fulfilled and done away with, amen. Like we said in Sunday school this morning. And then we look at the, the uh, civil law that came over. Jesus did do away with the ceremonial law. You can't be saved by sacrifices. You never could anyway. None of them were saved with that. Look what it says here. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Look at verse 29. And they passed by, and what's that next word? Railed on him. That, that's the definition of blasphemy. So these two men are together with him hanging on the cross, and they're railing against him. They're blaspheming him as, he sit, as he's on the cross next to them. Amen? And they passed by and railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, uh, 
Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Look at verse 31. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others himself, he cannot save. So they're blaspheming him. They're making fun of him. They're saying these things about him. They're reviling against him. Look at verse 32. Uh, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Listen. And they that were what? Crucified with him did what? Reviled him. In other words, they were all doing it. They were all blaspheming. They were all reviling Christ He's on the cross. Now listen, we don't have time. I need to finish up here. You remember what happened at the cross, don't you? Remember? The Bible says there was three of them. He had the other two male factors. Do you remember what happened to the one? Do you remember that? The Bible just told us they're blaspheming and railing against him, and yet one of them got saved, didn't he? Didn't one of them get saved? So this is the idea that you can blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ, you can blaspheme God, and you know what? He can still save you, just like he did to that man. But what he cannot save you from is blaspheming the Holy Ghost of God. Charging as they did. Amen? Listen, do you understand what they said to him again? It's an amazing thing, what they did. The scribes were guilty of speaking evil of the Holy Ghost by attributing Jesus' power to an unclean spirit. That's what verse 30 tells us. They were in fact, listen, this is amazing. They were in fact calling and saying of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, they were calling him a demon. Can you imagine? He who's eternal, he who's been with the Father and with the Son eternally, perfectly united, perfectly together, needing no one but themselves. These men come and say, you're not the Holy Spirit, you're the unholy Spirit. Calling the Spirit of God. He, I was explaining to Seth again this morning, because we're going through the Trinity. What's the Trinity of God? Amen? Well, I can't see him. And I said, well, look, the Bible says that he's a, is he, he or she. I said, he's a he. The Bible says that person, that pronoun, he. He is a person. It's the third person of the Trinity. He who was, and if we had time, you go to Genesis chapter 1, you'll see him there, won't you? During creation, Genesis chapter 1. The very beginning of time and history, the Spirit of God is there. You go all the way to Revelation chapter 22, and all through the pages of Holy Writ, and there's the Holy Spirit working and moving and doing His bidding, calling sinners, saving people. It's an amazing thing. All the way to the end of Revelation chapter 22, this third person of the Trinity, He, this very personal person, He's not a force. He's not like, you know, you turn on Star Wars and... What is that? That, that? The guy that can't breathe, what's his name? Breeze or whatever. And then he goes, Oh, the force be with you, Luke. <laughs> is that what he says? I don't know. That's not the Holy Spirit, brother. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity who is mighty and powerful and holy and good and righteous. And everything he does, he glorifies who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, this nonsense you see on TV, we, we need to close. You've seen it. You've seen it. These men barking like dogs and wholly puking and jumping. And, it's just insanity. That's blasphemy the other way. That's attributing something to the Holy Spirit he's not doing. That's not of God. Holy barfing? That, I'll tell you, is from their father. That's right. Their father, the devil. And they're just like him. The Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, all he does is glorify his son. He will never contradict his son. He will never do anything that isn't in unison with God the Father and God the Son. That's what he does. Amen. It's a dangerous thing, brethren. You look down the pit of hell when you begin to accuse the Holy Spirit of God of doing something, amen, that is demonic. That's why we have writ. i got to close. Listen, this is why we have holy writ. Let me close with this. Turn with me just quickly in your Bibles to 1 John. And we'll finish. We'll close with this. Look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. You remember a few months ago, myself and J.D. Hall and uh, 
Chris Roseboro preached out in Dickinson together. And uh, you remember this. First John chapter 4. Look here what the Bible tells us to do, brethren. Beloved. Every time it says beloved, it's speaking of who? Christians. Every time. Brethren, believe not every what? Spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are got out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of who? Antichrist, whereof ye have heard it, and that it should come, and even already is in the world. Listen, I've got a book at home, and I'm going to close. Listen. I have a book at home called Mary, Mary, Quite Contrary. And uh, these, these apparitions show up. They show up. They show up, brothers, and they do all kinds of stuff. It's, it's a stunning thing to do. It really is. It's a stunning thing to watch. They'll sit there, you know, they got little baby Jesus. Hey, can, I, can I tell you, Jesus is not a little baby anymore. Amen? He's a conquering Savior who shed his blood. He's not a little baby sitting on someone's arm, and they'll show up, those apparitions show up, and they'll tell the crowd, oh, do this, do that, do that. Oh, sprinkle this on me, do this and that. And there was one particular story where one of them showed up doing its thing, knowing, saying things that Jesus would never say. God would never say that. And so one man in the crowd opened up his Bible and said, well, I'm going to test this spirit. <coughs> Is Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And you know what it did? It left. Immediately. Stunning. He they were sprinkling water on him and doing all kinds of this thing kept telling, well, do this, do this to prove I'm this, I'm the really of God. Do this, do this, do this. All the guy did is get out his cannon and ask it to confess that. And it would not. It's amazing. There's so many things like, brother, listen, we must be careful. We must be ever vigilant, amen. Because we can be led, as my father in law or my stepdad did, your feelings will deceive you much. You will feel you're right. And you're not. Because the word of God says you're not. We must then, brethren, amen, submit ourselves to the only truth we know. To that which is never lied about, which never lies, that which is completely true. The Lord Jesus Christ and what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto you this morning, that what Jesus says is true. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, again, are just so thankful for your word this morning. Thankful God that uh, we have it, that you were gracious and kind to us. And Father, we must be very careful, very vigilant. In fact, Paul told young Timothy, the young preacher, he says, take heed therefore. In other words, be narrow-minded, be careful about what you do. Take heed, meditate on the word. Hey, hey speak the word. That's what we're to do. And Father, this morning I pray that you're word as it has been presented and as weak and feeble as I am all men are Father that it was preached right Father that it was understood properly that it was as Howard likes to say that it was cut straight and Father thank you again for saving those in this room whom you saved Father, we pray also again for those who are sitting here, and there's always lost people sitting here, Father, that maybe today was the day. Maybe two years ago someone planted. Maybe two years ago someone watered. Maybe four years ago. And the Bible says, Paul wrote under the inspiration of God, one waters, one plants, but God giveth the increase. So, Father, this morning we pray and ask. Now, Lord, as uh, we leave this place, as well as we actually gather for a fellowship meal afterwards, we pray, Father, that our conversation will be upright and good, that it will be holy, and, Father, that we will uh, be more and more transformed, conformed into the image of our Savior. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. All right, well, let's stand together this morning.
It is an amazing thing.